Thank you for joining Cancer Support Community Atlanta for this program. Please visit our website, cscatlanta.org, for a complete list of live and recorded events. If this is your first time participating, we invite you to complete a new attendee form to stay connected to all future programs. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our nutrition seminar today. This is Emily Brown, the program director at Cancer Support Community Atlanta. Thank you for joining us today for this nutrition seminar on eating the rainbow with fruits and vegetables presented by Kristen Kukulowski. Kristen does these presentations for us every month on the third Tuesday of the month at noon. Um, so please uh, feel free to join us every month and register for the program. Um, we also have our regular cooking demos, um, and next week or next month, we will be talking about fiber and carbohydrates. Um, so if you'd like to join that program, that will be on August 11th, and you can go to our website, cscatlanta.org, and register for that, or just email me at emily at cscatlanta.org. Um, so without further ado, I will go ahead and let you get started, Kristen. Thanks, Emily. And like Emily said, I'm Kristen. I am our oncology nutrition coordinator here at Northside Hospital. Um, and it is a pleasure to do these presentations every month for you guys. I do like to give a disclaimer up front um, that these presentations tend to be more geared towards survivorship um, type situations. So if you are actively going through cancer treatment and you would like to speak to a dietitian more one-on-one, -on -one, Northside does have dietitians that service most of the clinics that we um, are affiliated with. You can always ask your doctor for a referral. And then if you are not from Northside and you're from one of our other um, healthcare systems around Atlanta, they also tend to have dietitians available so they can look at your medical records and give you more individualized care that way. Um, so we will go ahead and get started with Eat the Rainbow with Fruits and Vegetables. And I did um, tell Emily before I got started here that I told my husband what the um, topic was and he asked me why I was promoting Skittles. So we are not talking about Skittles here we are talking about our fruits and veggies. So our objectives for today are to review the current recommendations for reducing cancer risk and cancer recurrence risk. Um, and that will tie into our color theme, discussing the benefits of eating more color, um, including what the differences between phytonutrients and antioxidants, because those are some big buzzwords that get thrown around right now. And then also reviewing the new American plate and the plate method for easy meal planning to help increase your consumption of fruits and veggies. So these are the top 10 um, recommendations from the American Institute for Cancer Research. And they're an organization who does a lot of um, global research. Um, they're under a global name. So these are all more American based type things, but it's important that they pull the research globally and then also by country so they can narrow in on what the recommendation should be. So these are for lifestyle recommendations. So you can see being a healthy weight, being physically active, eat a diet rich in whole grains, vegetables, fruits, and legumes, limiting your consumption of fast food and other high in fat foods or starches and sugars, um, limiting the consumption of red and processed meats, limiting the consumption of sugar sweetened beverages, limiting alcohol consumption, not using supplements for cancer prevention. Um, for mothers, breastfeed your baby if you can. And then after a this is following as many of these recommendations as you can. So I did go ahead and bold some of the ones that we would be talking about today, because obviously if we're eating more color, we're focusing more on our vegetables and fruits. Um, and then we will also be talking about being a healthy weight and then um, trying to avoid using supplements when possible. So the current recommendations from, again, the American Institute for Cancer Research, they um, abbreviated as AICR, advises that we get at least of fiber from food, surface, food sources per day. So just because I recently went on a quest to up my fiber intake, you would be surprised to learn that the average American only gets between 10 and 15 grams of fiber per day. So that's half. Um, sometimes less than half of what the fiber needs to be. Um, so it is quite the challenge to get all the fiber that we should be getting today. And if you're tracking that, you'll quickly learn um, that pretty much at every meal, you have to have food that contains some kind of fiber to be able to meet this overall at the end of the day. 
So trying to eat a minimum of three and a half to five cups of vegetables and fruits each day is also part of that recommendation. And our fruits and vegetables contain um, fiber. Most of them contain fiber. So this helps us to get to that goal of 30 grams per day. And then I do get a lot of questions on whether or not I need to eat fresh, frozen, or canned. And so fresh, um, frozen, and canned, any of those will work. It depends on what your specific diet needs are, what your budget is, what's in season, what's not in season, what you're making as far as your recipe goes. So you're not limited to only eating fresh fruits and vegetables. You can have a variety. If you do get canned fruits and veggies, you want to make sure that there's no added salt, no added fat, um, and no added sugar. So a lot of the canned fruits now come uh, packed in their own juice. So they're not adding the extra syrup and that kind of thing in there. And then with the frozen vegetables, you'll see those a lot now too, where they have these different mixes that have sauces on them and you would just want to be cautious with those because those can be higher in salt um, and then they could also have some extra um, added fat in there to make them taste a little bit better and you just want to be cautious with those depending on what else you're making for the rest of the meal. And then focusing on incorporating a variety of whole grains and beans and legumes. So like Emily said, next month's topic is going to be on fiber and carbohydrates because they tend to um, get a bad rap, at least carbohydrates do, and whole grains are a very important part of our diet. So cutting out an entire food group um, can be very harmful. So whole grains, beans, and legumes are also excellent sources of fiber. So we definitely don't want to be cutting those foods out and limiting ourselves from those nutrients. So our benefits of eating more color, um, the first one would be that it provides a variety of vitamins, minerals, fiber, and phytochemicals. Um, and then another term for phytochemicals is phytonutrients. So if you see one of those in an article that you're reading, they're um, interchangeable. And those are just the little, um, well, we'll talk about them here in a minute, but every different fruit and vegetable that's a different color has different vitamins, minerals, and different phytonutrients that make up that color. And that's why we really promote trying to eat a rainbow or eat different kinds of colors with your meals, because then you're going to be getting different kinds of vitamins or different kinds of phytochemicals while you're eating those different foods. Um, eating more color. So again, if you're focusing on your fruits and vegetables, that can help with your weight management because they are low, lower calorie foods naturally. Um, so here in the West, uh, we tend to eat more high calorie, high fat foods. And so we're really looking to see where we can plug in those lower calorie foods. But again, the other benefit of these fruits and vegetables is their fiber content and that fiber helps to keep us full longer so you're not as hungry as often so not only are they lowering probably have to eat less times throughout the day because you're going to feel full for longer if you weren't eating that fiber and then they also help to protect against several chronic diseases. So not just cancer, but also heart disease and diabetes. And this is believed to be because of their anti-inflammatory properties where they bring down that chronic inflammation that can fester in our bodies. Um, so you're going to be protected against other things, not just your cancer. And then some cancers have actually been associated with low intake of plant foods. So by having a diet that's low in plant foods, then a cancer could be associated with your diet patterns. And those include your lung, oral, esophageal, stomach, and colon. So what is the difference between an antioxidant versus a phytonutrient? So an antioxidant is a substance that prevents damage to a cell from free radicals. So your free are little molecules, they're highly reactive and they're unstable. And we do have them in our body and we do have to have a balance between our antioxidants and the free radicals. We just don't want there to be more free radicals than we have antioxidants. So the free radicals can actually cause um, damage to our cells and those have been linked to a variety of chronic diseases. So we're trying to make sure that those antioxidants are there to help balance out those free radicals and make them less reactive and less unstable so they're not creating so much damage. So a phytonutrient, many of our phytonutrients actually antioxidants. So they're there to help neutralize these free radicals. And some can increase cancer cells tendency to self-destruct. So um, that would be the, you know, killing itself. So you're not having to um, let it grow. Others may also start 
um, stop carcinogens before they even have a chance to begin the process of cancer development. And then other nutrients may also block the development of new blood vessels that tumors need. And then again, some of them fight inflammation. So each phytonutrient has its own role, its own benefit that it's providing. And again, the different colors of the different fruits and vegetables are going to be different kinds of phytonutrients. So that's really why we want that variety and that rainbow uh, that we're striving for throughout the week. So again, phytonutrient or phytochemical, it's just a broad term for a variety of compounds that are produced by plants. They're gonna be found in your fruits, vegetables, beans, grains, and other plants. They provide um, the plants with their color, their odor, and their flavor. Another thing to here um, would be your herbs or your seasonings that, you know, dill weed or basil, uh, oregano, those are all from plant foods too. So they're going to have chemical makeup as well. And then researchers estimate that there are about a thousand different kinds of phytonutrients and they've only been able to study a very small fraction of them so far. Um, so there's still a lot to uh, figure out in this world, but um, what they have found out and it does show um, good benefits. So let's keep going. And I am not going to pretend to be able to say all of the names properly of these things. Um, so some of them I will skip over, but phytonutrients, these are some of the common names. Antioxidants obviously are very um, popular. Flavonoids, phytochemicals, um, flavones, isoflavonones. Um, I'll just stop there because it's just going to get worse. But these are all different kinds and we're gonna go through each of these and show you what color vegetable or fruit goes with them and how you can incorporate those into your diet. All right, so our red fruits and vegetables contain lycopene and lycopene is a type of carotenoid. So the role that they play is in cell communication and it's also a strong antioxidant. So sources would be your tomatoes and tomato-based products, watermelon, pink grapefruit, um, guava and apricots. And sometimes you'll see in here that things may not like be bright red. They might have a different hue of um, red or a different color than what is on here, but they still contain this specific nutrient. So our red and purple are anthocyanins. I hopefully said that right, um, a type of flavonoid. And again, it's an antioxidant and it helps to fight inflammation. So our big sources of these would be your berries. So blackberries, raspberries, blueberries, cranberries, they're all different colors, um, grapes, cherries, your eggplant. Um, so sometimes people get a little confused when the outside of a certain vegetable or fruit is one color and the inside um, is a different color. So eggplants could be an example of that where they're purple more on the outside and they tend to be more white or creamy colored on the inside, but they're still gonna fall under this red purple category. Um, red wine, red cabbage, and then black rice can also contain these. In our orange category, you see a lot of alpha and beta carotene, and these are part of the carotenoid family. So you see a lot of overlap happening between different uh, nutrients here, but carotenoids again are an antioxidant and they help to create vitamin A. And we know that our vitamin A is essential for growth response and then also keeping our eyesight healthy. So good source, the carotenoids would be your carrots, mangoes, pumpkin, sweet potatoes, and red bell peppers. And then we have like a little orange yellow um, situation, which, sorry, I can't see my full screen here. Um, but beta cryptoxanthin um, has anti-inflammatory and also antihistamine properties. And so some sources of this would be your cantaloupe, peaches, which are definitely in season here in Georgia, tangerines, papaya, um, persimmons, and oranges. So the other thing to remember too, because sometimes people will ask me, you know, what's the healthiest or what's the best fruit or what's the best vegetable? And so it's very hard to be able to only pick one because you can see how all of these things contain different nutrients and they have these different properties. So that's also something to keep in mind as well. 
We have no one food is better than the other. We have to have that variety. All right, so green would be our gluco. I wish I could see my whole screen, but I cannot. Um, so may reduce cancer risk by protecting oxidative damage. Um, and these help to activate enzymes in our body that are involved in removing carcinogens from our body. Um, so this would be important to help make sure that these carcinogens aren't festering into cancer. And sources would include your cruciferous vegetables, which are your broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, also turnips, bok choy, and kale. So I do know a lot of people who are focusing on their health um, tend to lean very heavily on these foods, which is great. You obviously need them, but don't forget about your other ones too. All right, so our yellow and greens are also members of the carotenoid family. And again, they um, help to decrease, decrease risk for diseases of the eye that can come with aging. So the more we can incorporate these, hopefully our eyes will be um, stronger as we get older. So spinach, avocado, watercress, um, green beans, green bell peppers, broccoli and peas. Hopefully there's things in here that all of you guys like. Um, our white products, which uh, I hear from a lot of patients who have spoken to different providers and they tell them to cut out anything white. Um, so I'm doing that, you've got a lot of good white foods out there that are still good for you. I think what they mean is to limit more processed foods, but the um, more of your white things here and again, sorry, you can read what they are across the top. I just can't see it. May help prevent with bone loss in women with osteoporosis. And then studies have also shown a powerful antibacterial effect in these foods. And then they may stop cell mutations, help prevent DNA damage and stop cell growth of the tumor. So the sources here would be your leeks, garlic and onions. So definitely including those and in a lot of your recipes can be helpful. And then steps that you can take now um, to help with this. So if your diet doesn't quite look like this picture over here yet with all these different colors, that's okay. That's a, an end goal for a lot of people, but you always have to start somewhere. So definitely focusing on eating a varied diet that's a variety of different vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and beans is gonna be top priority. It really helps to make sure that you're getting in that fiber but also getting in all of the different colors and that you're not just stuck on one or two different kinds of foods. So you wanna to try to favor when you're out shopping for these items, um, fruits and vegetables that are more brightly colored um, or strongly flavored. So those tend to be the ones that are the most ripe or the most in season. So I like to use the example of tomatoes because everyone in the South here seems to like tomatoes. But if you think about your tomatoes in the summer where they're super red and juicy, when you cut into them, like the inside's red, the outside's red, there's lots of juice going on versus maybe a tomato that you purchase in the winter where it's still red, um, but it's much more pale on the inside. So it's still gonna have good nutrients. I'm not saying to avoid them by any means, but you can definitely tell a difference when something is much more ripe or in season. And it probably has more of these um, vitamins and minerals and phytonutrients more developed um, from the growing process than if it was picked or grown during the off season. Um, you can just, tell the difference in the flavoring and also, again, the colors and even the odors that you might find. So that's a good tip. Sometimes people ask about that. And that's another benefit of frozen fruits and vegetables is that they tend to be picked at the peak of their ripeness and then they're flash frozen and then packaged and frozen for us. So they keep that nutrient profile. So uh, sometimes people will ask, you know, does it lose its nutrients or am I losing stuff? And you might lose some just from the general process of thawing it out or having to cook it. Um, but that's okay. If you're focusing on getting enough fruits and vegetables throughout the week, the little bit that's lost isn't going to override all of the benefits that are coming from those. And then we definitely wanna to try to stick with the food sources. So, you know, I broke down the phytonutrient profiles um, and gave you the names of those things, but you don't need to go out and purchase supplements that only contain carotenoids. Um, that's where we can get into a little bit of danger, not knowing the safety of those things because supplements in the US are not regulated um, by the FDA. And so it can, you know, you don't know what you're purchasing. And we also just don't know 
how taking it out of its food source and giving it as just a sole um, nutrient, how your body's going to react. Like, are you giving yourself too much? Was there something in the food source that helps our body to utilize or absorb that nutrient better? And so because of that, the AICR recommends to not use supplements for cancer prevention or to reduce your risk of cancer. And the exception to that is if you have been diagnosed with a deficiency, if your doctor said that your vitamin D level was low and asked you to take a vitamin D or told you to take a vitamin D or that they feel like you need to take calcium, you know, those are different. Um, your doctors actually examined you and looked at you and that's what they determined. But as far as just going out and buying a bunch of different supplements, you know, definitely talking to your healthcare provider before you do that would be a much better recommendation than just going out and purchasing a lot of different supplements. And it can be very expensive too. And some of these can actually interact with some of our treatments um, or cause side effects that you might not be aware of. So it's just best to talk through it and really know what you're getting yourself into before diving in and spending the money on those kind of things. So if you've been here before, uh, one of our presentations, you know that I love to use the plate method. And I like the plate method because it really makes meal planning easy. And a lot of people don't necessarily always know where to start. Um, but using something like this simple plate to really think about how your meal is going to be set up can help you balance your nutrients and plate um, into different sections just to get your mind thinking about meal planning. You don't always have to use this. And if you're an advanced meal planner already, then um, you know this might be a little basic for you, but this is always a great place to start. So you can see over um, on the plate that it's a nine inch plate and nine inch plates tend to be the size of our um, salad plates. So it's not a big dinner plate. It's the small, also the volume of food that we eat is important. Um, so a should be a protein of some kind. It can be an animal protein or a plant-based protein. So in this picture, it's a piece of chicken. And a protein portion is about four ounces. And that's about the size of a deck of cards, just to put that into perspective. And then the other fourth of the plate is a grain or a starch. Um, so this could be a starchy vegetable like a sweet potato, or it could be a grain, something like a uh, wild rice. And then the other half of your plate, you wanna to try to have that to be non-starchy vegetables. So this is a salad mix, but if you can do one or two different kinds of veggies up here, so you have different colors, that's going to help you get to that more of the eating the rainbow type mentality. And then you can see off to the side, there's just a little half cup of fruit up there, which are some berries and then a low calorie beverage. We're gonna dive a little bit further into this here. So I do get a lot of questions about non-starchy versus starchy vegetables. So these are not every vegetable in the world. These are just some of the common ones, but your non-starchy vegetables don't contain um, a lot of starch and they contain a good amount of fiber. So asparagus, artichoke, um, green beans or wax beans, Brussels sprouts, beets, broccoli, cabbage, carrots, cauliflower, celery, cucumbers, eggplant, um, a lot of your different greens, mushrooms, onions, uh, pea pods, peppers, salad greens, so arugula, romaine lettuce, uh, tomatoes, turnips, zucchini. Um, so you've got a wide variety and a lot of these were listed throughout the presentation with this. And then your starchy vegetables, you can also incorporate these, but you wanna put them down more in this um, grain and starch area in that fourth of a plate. Um, so that could be your parsnip, plantains, potatoes, both sweet and white, pumpkin, acorn squash, butternut squash, your green peas, and corn. Um, so they also contain fiber. They also contain different colors. So these are still going to be healthy food options. You just want to um, balance them out with your starch and your grain type foods to make sure you're not overloading yourself. So I love that plate, but the AICR actually has this new American plate as well. Um, so it's a very similar concept where you're sticking to a fourth or less of your plate being from an animal protein, and then the rest of your plate really being from plants. So both non-starchy vegetables, your starchy veggies, and your whole grains and beans. Can see the plate is very similar but just slightly different so you've got a little bit of um, options to choose from when you're thinking about your meal planning but by using these different 
plate methods, you can actually focus on foods that are rich in fiber, your vitamins and phytonutrients to help protect against your um, cancer recurrence or reducing your risk of cancer. And then modest, again, three to four ounce serving of meat. So it could be fish, poultry, or red meat. Um, if you don't eat animal proteins, that's perfectly fine. You can fill that in with some of your plant-based proteins. And then having a variety of foods. So at least have so you can see their broccoli and their carrots here. And then they also included a healthy serving of a tasty whole grain. So we're just gonna say that that is brown rice up there. Um, so you can see that they have a variety. And sometimes this can be harder if you live by yourself or maybe there's only two of you and you don't wanna buy a lot of um, different fruits and vegetables because you're afraid they're gonna go bad. So this could be a good instance where doing um, some more frozen options. So that way you're able to use just what you need and then freeze the rest and go on with your day. But that way you're getting a variety. You're not running the risk of your food going bad and you wasting food and spending money on stuff that you um, could have spent elsewhere. So that is another thing to keep in mind when you're thinking about grocery shopping and then meal planning here. So, Again, your plate might already look like that, or your plate could look more like this plate here, which they call the old American plate. And so you can see that it's very, um, a large piece of meat here. This is probably an eight to 12 ounce steak. And if you think about back when we used to go out to eat um, a little bit more than we do now with COVID, but if you went to a restaurant and you wanted a piece of steak um, or even a chicken, they're usually eight to 12 ounce cuts. And that is double to triple the amount that we actually need for one meal. Um, so definitely keeping that in mind when you're, again, grocery shopping or if you're out to eat, um, that we do tend to overdo it on our protein foods. And then you can also see that they have two different kinds of starchy vegetables. Um, so there's mashed potatoes and then your green peas. Again, a little bit of color, definitely do better. So here's a transition plate. If that's what your plate is used to and you're looking to make some changes, this could be uh, what you move to next. So you've got a much more um, moderate piece of meat. So this is more of a four to six ounce serving of meat. So still a little bit larger than what we look for, but it's definitely a step in the right direction. And then you've got a big, um, portion of green beans taking up a good chunk of the plate, which is great. And then also you've got, we're going to call this again, brown rice over to the side. Um, so again, definitely a step in the right direction, but you're not having as much variety. So there's only that one green color here, which again is great. Um, but we want to see if we can step it up even a little bit more from here. So this is an ideal, what an ideal plate might look like. So you've got three ounces of meat. I believe this is chicken on the plate here. So it's about the size of a deck of cards. And then they actually have a variety of different veggies. So they've got some broccoli to the side and then they've got like a squash mixture. Um, so it's got some yellow squash, some zucchini and I'm gonna call those some red bell peppers in there. So, you know, it's not too much of one, vegetable, um, but it's a mixture. So you're able to either save that for leftovers if you make cut up a whole zucchini or a whole summer squash, or if you have somebody else living at home with you, um, then it's easy to split that up and not waste your food. And then you can also see that they have a whole grain on the plate there. So it's nothing too drastic. Again, your plate may already look like this and you're like, oh, I am already doing a great job. Um, but I've always found, even in my own meals, if I look at certain um, favorites that I have that, you know, there's always room for improvement. I'm like, I've only got one color here. What else can I throw in the salad to make it uh, have some life to it and some different colors? So there's always something fun to be done uh, to, to give yourself some variety. Here's another option. So sometimes we get very fixated on, you know, the actual plate and how it looks, but this is more of like a bowl or like a stir fry almost that you can do. So please do not feel limited to having to section off each of your uh, different quadrants on your plate, but you can actually toss things together and make a one pot meal definitely work this way. So again, it's got broccoli, it's got onions, it's got carrots, there are mushrooms in here. And then um, there's little pieces of chicken that are cut up in here. And then also, again, they really like rice at the AICR, um, some rice to make that stir fry. So you can definitely get creative do um, another option. 
So enjoying more fruits and vegetables. I did send a handout to Emily that I think she posted in the chat box or she's gonna send out to you guys later, but it's 20 ways to eat more fruits and veggies. I think is what it's called, um, but it's just some different tips on how to incorporate these things. Because like I told you, in the last three weeks, I've really just been focusing on how many grams of fiber I've been able to get in per day. And it does take all day um, to reach that 25 to 30 grams of fiber. Um, so you really have to think strategically about your snacks, about your breakfast, lunch, and dinner um, to make sure that you are getting fiber in at each of those. And sometimes that can be daunting and you can get a little bit bored. So you always want some different ideas here. So trying crunchy vegetables instead of chips for dipping. Um, so you could use bell peppers, carrots, broccoli, celery, cucumbers, really just anything that you like to eat. And you can dip those in pretty much any of the dips that you would normally be eating. Obviously there are healthier dips there, but if this again is one step in the right direction by switching out chips for veggies, then start there. Um, keeping cut up veggies on hand um, that you can easily snack on, make side dishes out of, or just do a quick nibble with your dinner um or as your dinner's cooking just to help fill you up a little bit if you're starving is very helpful so again on my quest for fiber somehow i ended up with a bag of like full-sized carrots and i was actually shredding my carrots for my salad like with a grater by hand and it added like an additional 30 minutes to make my week's worth of salads and i think it's just because my shredded carrots had gone bad so those are things to think about. Like it was easier for me to buy a bag of shredded carrots than to spend 30 minutes cutting my own carrots up. And I was much more likely to eat those shredded than I was getting a huge bag of carrots and shredding them myself. So sometimes you have your time and your barriers. So thinking about things like that, like, you know, a lot of uh, grocery stores now have pre-cut up veggies that are fresh. And sometimes if you're, schedule does not permit or you can't stand up long enough to do stuff like that because you're fatigued you know that is perfectly fine there's no reason why you can't rely on having somebody else cut up your veggies for you just to make things a little bit easier and for you to be able to get those um, fruits and veggies in so perfectly fine um, it's a grilling season right now so thinking about grilling fruit kebabs for dessert can be very helpful uh, pineapples peaches bananas those all taste great on the grill using veggies as pizza toppings. So if you have favorite pizzas um, or you make your own pizzas at home, or even if you buy pizzas, you can always add your own vegetables on there and um, just to help enhance the number of veggies. Or if you're getting pizza, you can also do like a side salad on the side. So my dad used to eat like half to a whole pizza on his own. Um, and then I worked with him on getting down to two to three slices of pizza and then also having a side salad to the side to make sure that he was getting his vegetables in for that meal. So you can always get creative there. Stocking your frozen veggies um, to steam or stir fry is a quick, easy side dish and one that you don't really have to think about. And again, a lot of the stores tend to have those sales like 10 for $10 um, or buy one get one free so you can really stock up during those sale times to help um with your budget and then just make sure that you have a variety of stuff going on in your freezer so if you're like oh i have this lovely piece of salmon I'm gonna have a as a side you can easily look in your freezer and be like oh i've got broccoli i've got um butternut squash i'm trying to think of all the things i like with my salmon so you can you know quickly pull those and get those together um, if you like to make baked potatoes, you can top those with beans and salsa, or you could do like a broccoli and a low fat cheese. Again, you're thinking about how to add more plants or more variety to things that you're already doing. Waking up to fruit, so making it a habit of adding fruit uh, can be a good way to start your day with some kind of a plant or um, some fiber. And then if you're more of a savory type person, you like to make omelets in the morning, you can stuff those full of veggies and um, already be off to a good start for the day. So I also get this question a lot, do I need to buy organic foods? And so my general statement here would be that buying organic foods might make sense for you um, and you may be able to afford those or they might be readily available in your area. So if that is what you like to eat or you prefer, that is perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But currently research shows that by eating a diet that is, um, 
variety of plant foods, whether they are organic or not organic, is really what matters as far as our health goes right now. Um, so if you cannot afford organic food, that is perfectly fine. You can do conventionally grown items and still get the benefits of the nutrients that are in those foods too. So um, personal preference at this point, and um, I typically leave it there. And then as far as supplements go, um, we don't really get the same effect with supplements that you do from eating whole foods. Um, so nutrients tend to work together to be more beneficial. So that thought of isolating the single compound out of whatever food it happens to be is not going to necessarily give you the same effect that if you were eating the whole food. Um, so some supplements can cause more harm than good. So a couple examples of this would be our high dose supplements of beta carotene have actually shown um, a possible increased risk of lung cancer and mortality with lung cancer. So, you know, eating foods that are rich in beta carotene are fine, but when you pull it out into a supplement, a lot of supplements, if you actually flip it over and look at the label, um, you know, it might be 3% of your daily recommended intake. Uh, so those we call mega dose supplements there need to be used with caution or at the very least talked with your physician or even your dietitian about before you um, embark on those. And then green tea extract supplements have been linked to several cases of liver damage. Um, so again, drinking green tea is one thing, but actually extracting some of those nutrients out and making a supplement out of it could lead to um, liver damage and some other uh, side effects that you might not be aware of. And then there are a lot of supplements that can cause our blood to thin. That's one of their side effects um, and can increase our risk for bleeding for some people but for others who may already have some conditions, they just want to use caution. So again, it's like a garlic supplement. Now I'm not talking about like throwing garlic in your pasta when you cook it, um, but an actual garlic supplement, um, resveratrol, turmeric, and capsicum um, are other examples of blood thinning supplements. So again, could be fine for some, but again, it's always safest to talk to somebody about it before uh, taking those. And then many supplements can also interfere or interact with our medications, including some chemotherapies. Um, so green tea with Velcade can be a concern and then quercetin and Taxol can also be a concern. So again, safest to always tell your physician and your dietitian what supplements you're taking um, so we can make sure to double check those that they're not causing more harm to you or gonna interact with some of your treatments. So in summary, striving to eat a plant-focused diet is very important. We talk about that several times throughout the year. That does not mean you have to be vegan or vegetarian. It's just a big focus on making sure that you are getting those plant foods in. And part of eating the rainbow is eating a lot of plants. So um, focusing on that is going to be crucial. And then getting five or more servings of fruits and vegetables per day, also important. So if you remember towards the beginning, we said three and a half to five cups of fruits and vegetables per day. So that's going to be about your five servings there. And eating a variety of fruits and veggies and other plant foods. So I know that can be difficult, again, if you live on your own or there's only two of you there because you um, don't want your food to go to waste. So don't limit yourself to just fresh fruits and vegetables, you can do frozen and then some canned stuff as well. And the different colors are going to be representing different anti-cancer components. Um, do not rely on supplements to protect you against cancer. Um, you have to have that good foundation, that good diet um, going on. And then always telling your physician and your dietitian what supplements you're taking so they can make sure that you are being safe. So here are some sources for you. These are very great, easy um, websites to navigate around for some more information if you want to dive a little bit deeper. And I think that's all I have for us today. Do we have any questions, Emily? Thank you, Kristen. I don't see any questions yet. I did put that um, handout in the chat box for anybody who's interested in those 20 ways to enjoy more fruits and veggies. Um, and I'll also have that on our website, csatlanta.org. Um, so it's easy to access there as well if you aren't able to access it in the chat box. 
Uh, but yeah, if anyone has any questions for Kristen, feel free to jump in, unmute yourself, raise your hand, um, however you'd like to ask. Just wanted to reiterate what Kristen said that her next program will be on August 17th on making sense of macronutrients, part one, talking about carbohydrates. Uh, and we will also have our cooking demo next week, which will also for our next month, which will also focus on carbohydrates. And that'll be on Wednesday, August 11th, as I mentioned before. So if nobody has any questions, I think we can wrap for the day. Uh, Kristen, thank you again for a wonderful presentation. See thank you all you next everybody. month. Bye. Thank you for joining Cancer Support Community Atlanta for this program. If you're interested in other live or recorded programs, please visit the online program tab of our website, cscatlanta.org. Or follow us on Facebook. We'll be sharing additional information on upcoming programs.